Creative Warnings ever since. So um, after that, like for the next couple months, Pat and I kept in touch, and she got me plugged in with a couple other events that she was involved with. And eventually, she asked me whether I would be interested in speaking in Creative Warnings myself. So that leads me to today. So after all of this, um, you have Pat to blame for me being here. Um, now, before I get into my talk, I wanted to start off with another disclaimer, which is just that um, I'm 28 years old, okay, and I don't have it all figured out. I really don't. Um, and so today, I, this is not like a success story, okay? This is not like me telling you about all the wisdom that I had and, and all the steps that led me here in a very logical fashion. Um, so it wasn't all due to hard work um, on one hand, right? And nor do I think that it was all luck, right? I would like to give myself the credit that it wasn't all just random luck. So I think that what I realized, uh, looking back and reflecting back over the years, is that there's this magical place in between those two extremes, where this, in this sweet spot between luck and effort, maybe we'll find serendipity. So that's where I think serendipity comes into play and what I want to talk about today. So what is serendipity, right? So as a concept, I think serendipity is all around us and we're all very familiar with it. Um, very popular apps like Spotify or Pandora or services like Birchbox, um, Trunk Club, you name it, all kind of rely on serendipity to help us discover new products, things that we might love, new music, new brands, you name it. And there's also online dating apps like Tinder or Coffee Meets Bagel where the stakes are slightly higher, right? Where you might serendipitously meet somebody that you otherwise wouldn't have met. Um, so I think that all of these apps rely on this concept that some people have termed engineering serendipity, right? Where the whole point is to kind of foster serendipitous outcomes and discoveries and possibilities and make that possible for you. So today, what I wanna share is some examples of where I've seen serendipity play a role in my life. And again, like looking back, not having figured this out proactively, but realizing where maybe I was engineering serendipity along the way and how you might be able to do the same and try to incorporate more serendipity into your life. So uh, to, to start at the beginning of my story, I have to take you all the way back to the summer before my freshman year at Harvard. So I got a Facebook message from a current Harvard senior at the time who had reached out and she, she had done a search on Facebook for people within the Harvard network that had listed web design as one of their interests on Facebook. Okay, and I had, which I'll get to in a, in a little bit. Um, now, I don't think this, this profile section even exists very much anymore, and I don't think people are searching for people by interest, but this is 2007, and that's when it did exist. And so when she did this search, um, I came up in her search results. And so she emailed me, and she explained that she was the editor-in-chief of this publication called Freeze, which was a print publication 
um, a lifestyle and fashion magazine for Harvard College women. And she was looking for somebody to build a website for it. Um, whereas it had only existed in print form, she wanted to bring it online. And so she reached out to me and she said, hey, do you want to get involved with this? Like, I would be able to offer you a position on the executive board as a freshman. And so, of course, I was super tantalized by that, like, so exciting to, to have an opportunity to get involved right from the get-go, like, not even on campus yet. Um, so I ended up saying yes. And, and so that summer, I kind of started working on this website and trying to figure out how I could create a magazine, right, an online magazine, something I had never done before. And um, I launched it eventually uh, the freshman year, my freshman year um, in the fall semester once I matriculated. So also with me on that board were Stephanie and Windsor. This is a picture of us when we were freshmen, or when I was a freshman and we, were, uh, we met each other and, and had meetings and brainstorm sessions in dining halls. And they were a year ahead of me in school. Um, and after the three of us took over leadership of Freeze, uh, we started seeing a huge surge in readership, not, among, not just among Harvard College women, but really college women everywhere. And we realized that we had stumbled upon this unmet need, which was that there really wasn't any, any media out there targeted towards college women. Um, there are opportunities to write you know, for like a, a school newspaper or maybe a literary magazine, but there really wasn't any women's journalism on campus. And so we started thinking, what if we could do something bigger that was not just um, at Harvard, not just the student club here, but that could serve college women everywhere. See, we started getting readers from you know, our friends at other colleges who looked at what we, saw, what we had created and, and saw something that they didn't have. And they were reading our content, even though a lot of it was specific to Harvard. And this whole other set of friends was reaching out and saying, like, how can I do something like this at my college? And how can I put this content out there for the audience at my school? And so we realized that there was a huge opportunity out there, not just for college women readers, but also for student journalists who didn't have an opportunity to get that real world experience in women's magazine journalism while they were in college. And so later that year, um, in my sophomore year, we decided to enter the Harvard um, Undergraduate Business Plan Competition called the I3 Innovation Challenge with our idea for her campus, which would be a platform allowing any college woman on any campus to start her very own ma mini magazine on campus. And we would provide kind of the platform and the resources to allow them to create a microsite within her campus. And we were one of the winners that year. So on September 16, 2009, we ended up launching hercampus.com. And now fast forward about seven years, um, the Her Campus Media Network now receives over 70 million monthly content views. We have chapters at over 350 colleges around the world and a student contributor network of over 9,000 students. So I think that in hindsight, like looking back on this story, it sounds like so um, kind of fluid and flawless. But what I realized actually looking back is that there were so many moments of serendipity in there that you know, led to a decision that I made or something like that where I, it really was an unexpected result that we then pivoted from and we learned from. And like, who would have thought that a random Facebook message would have changed my life, right? It turned out that just listing that interest and having that on there made me like in the right moment at the right time for that person who was looking for me. And obviously I think that another point is that it was really important that I responded to that message at all, right? Um, I think, you know, being somebody who had just graduated from high school, not in college yet, like that's probably the summer when you are the most carefree in your life. Like there's nothing that you are worrying about. So I often reflect that um, in an alternate universe or maybe on another day, I would have just ignored that message. And who knows what would have happened at that point. Like who would have built this website for Freeze? Um, would that team of Stephanie and Windsor and myself be formed? Would her campus even exist? So these questions are really crazy uh, to think about, and they, um, I, I like, don't even know how to explain how it would have turned out. But this is the way it did. So it seems to me that one of the first steps for engineering serendipity is simply living in the moment and keeping your eyes open to the opportunities that might be before you, and being open to changing directions or doing something new that you didn't necessarily incorporate into your life plan before. And I think that 
for me, this starts with being really curious and passionate. So I want to explain why I even had web design in my uh, Facebook um, at that time. And it's because that I actually, even earlier on in my life, had this uh, passion for graphic design, which I don't know how it started, but in middle school, I, I started like following these di uh, different graphic designers online and looking at their websites. And I wanted to be just like them. And my parents recognized this interest in me. And as my graduation present from middle school, they actually bought me the Adobe Creative Suite, like version five, like a really old version. And it had Photoshop in it. And that was awesome. And so in my free time, like after doing homework and on the weekends and things like that, um, I would just, I would dabble in graphic design. And I was not very good in the beginning, but I think slowly and slowly I got kind of better at it and more proficient. And then obviously the next logical step after that was to create my own website where I could put this art um, just like these other graphic designers that I looked up to. And so that led to me, um, you know, needing to learn HTML. And I remember back then, because this is like, I don't know, 2004, 2003, um, there weren't as many resources out there for learning web design on your own. And I remember literally going into a bookstore and buying a book about coding for the internet, which is like hilarious. And I remember like looking at the book and like over here on my computer, learning how to make a paragraph and learning about tables and, and CSS and all of this. And it was very like old and antiquated, but um, a few, I just kind of got better at it. And I developed that first portfolio site of mine um, as a static HTML and CSS website. And it was not very good, it was really basic. Um, but every few months I would get tired of the design and I would want to try something new. And so I would have to learn a little bit more HTML or a little more CSS. And um, I would just eventually get a little bit better and better. And so this experience really built on itself until by the time I had graduated from high school, like I was passionate about web design and I felt competent enough and interested enough to actually list it on my Facebook. And then that led to that Facebook message. Um, and so I think that, you know, again, I want to remind you that this was not all part of a grand plan from when I was in middle school, right? My point is not to like make us all feel like, oh my God, like we wasted all this time from when we were in middle school. Like that's not it at all. I didn't have it figured out from when I was a kid. But my point is that without realizing it, I may have been engineering serendipity in a way because I was just actively pursuing my passions and then setting myself up for a serendipitous encounter later, right? By kind of pursuing my passions and giving that my all, I then had a unique opportunity that maybe other people didn't have. And so what seemed like a lucky occurrence was actually something that maybe was in the works, right? And so some people, um, you know, call serendipity luck, but I would differ and say that it's really not luck, it's you making your luck. And it's harnessing luck to have something that's fortuitous happen to you. All right, so, so what happened next? So I got serendipitously involved with Freeze and I met uh, Stephanie in Windsor and we launched her campus. And so what was next was actually turning it into a business model, um, taking an idea and making an actual company out of that. And it turns out that there's a lot of serendipity involved there too. So I think that launching a business is of course super strategic, very well thought out, very well planned in many ways. But a large part is also based, I think, on principles of serendipity, especially with these popular theories of, of startups uh, and how to, how to build companies like the lean startup model or putting out a minimum viable product, right, and seeing what happens or iterative product development and failing fast. All of these are concepts that tell you to put something out there and be open to seeing what happens. Like being open to being surprised and maybe changing your um, strategy after that as a result. So for my co-founders and myself, you could even say that we kind of stumbled upon our business model itself serendipitously, right? Like I mentioned before, we were initially only really interested in uh, modernizing this uh, publication that was available at Harvard and bringing it online to our audience and making it more accessible for students there. And we had no idea that it would then start attracting the attention of college students everywhere. Like, no idea. That was definitely not our intention, right? We didn't have that grand plan in the beginning. And then, once we actually launched her campus and you know, needed to start reaching out to local businesses because you know as a publisher that advertising is your bread and butter, 
Um, so we knew that we needed to reach out to local advertisers and all that, and we did start doing that. Um, we then again had no idea that we, this demographic that we were targeting was so valuable and was really a gold mine that we were sitting on because again, there wasn't any media out there. So it was really, really hard for these brands that wanted to connect to college students to do that. And so her campus turned out to be the perfect solution. And so we stumbled upon that and realized that you know, we needed to really double down on this approach. But again, not something that we thought of in the beginning. So around the same time, which was maybe a year into our operations, um, so this is the end of my junior year, um, Stephanie and Windsor had graduated at this point. And I thought that there was huge potential for her campus and they wanted to you know, work on her campus full time. They actually turned down other job offers to do that. And I initially tried to do my senior year and also run her campus at the same time, which didn't work out so well because I needed to be putting a lot more time into her campus and I, and I didn't, wasn't able to do that because I was in class all day. So I ended up taking the biggest risk of my life so far and I ended up leaving Harvard. So I actually uh, left Harvard, went on a leave of absence to be able to work on her campus full time with my co-founders. And I didn't know what the future held. Um, I had no idea if this would be a good decision or not, but I was kind of willing to take that risk. And it turns out that dropping out of Harvard does great things for your PR. So <laughs> I have been named in like this business, this really crazy Business Insider article that put me uh, next to Mark Zuckerberg and Bill Gates, like I'll take that. I think it's a little crazy, but um, you know, it did really great things for us in a way that I couldn't have expected. So I feel like the second thing about serendipity and how to incorporate it into your life more is to take risks, right? You have to get something out there. Like part of serendipity is the unexpected. And so um, giving ourselves an opportunity to be surprised, that's super, super important. Um, and I think that if you never take the time to experiment and put something out there, you might be missing out on what actually happens in the real world that is beyond just your planning, right? Your planning could be all wrong because that's not what actually happens in the real world. So I think it's really important to get out of just the business plan, to actually launch, to actually put something out there. Um, now, as every company grows, and certainly ours has as well, it seems like there's less and less room for serendipity, right, maybe? because there's more and more emphasis placed instead on forecasting and kind of getting expected results and, and setting a goal and achieving it, right? So in all of these cases, you're trying to attain a result that you're actively looking for, that you, that you expect. But doesn't that seem like the complete opposite of serendipity, right? Where you're looking for something unexpected or something unexpected happens to you in a good way? And dare I say that maybe as a company, begins to achieve predictable growth and scale, maybe the value and the influence of serendipity in that company begins to decline and protocol and all this structure starts to, starts to be much more important. And I think this is important, right? It is important for things to settle down. But in my opinion, I think it's really important that we resist that trend of serendipity losing its value. Because, I mean, even in my own story, I could see how important it was and what a role that it played for me. And I think it would be a miss to not incorporate it. So to just give a more of a practical example and like some practical advice that maybe you can take back to your teams. Um, one way that I have made sure that my team intentionally pursues and values serendipity is by pairing it with something else that as creatives we really value, which is inspiration, right? Inspiration is super important for somebody who is a creative. And I think that inspiration and serendipity go hand in hand. So what I did was I recently tasked my junior designer to put together a weekly design team newsletter um, and share it with the whole team every Friday during our design team meeting um, with you know, full-time designers, interns, everyone. And I think the closest example to this mandate that I've given her is like something like the Starship Enterprise maybe, where I've told her to go boldly forth and to explore new worlds and to bring samples back that can inspire and kind of enrich our team. And so I'm, she has brought that back in the form of you know, interesting articles or artist portfolio sites that we should be looking at, maybe local events that we can attend, um, typography samples, you name it. So I'm really, really proud of how I have, as a manager, allocated a portion of her time to actually be spent like in unplanned ways. 
and for her specifically to try to get kind of inspiration serendipitously. Um, because it's one thing that she has that serendipitous encounter, that effect is multiplied when you bring that back to a team. And it's multiplied when people start looking at you know, all this, these sources of inspiration and start finding connections and start maybe relating to things that they've, they've found and they kind of bring that into the team. And ultimately, I think, drawing inspiration and applying it to what we're working on that day and improving our work and making us more empathetic designers. So I think the third way that we can incorporate more serendipity into our lives is by actively seeking a perspective that's different from your own. So getting, going out there to see what's out there, maybe even having somebody tell you about in, interesting things because others will find the areas that you're blind to, right? They'll find the things that are a totally different point of view that you may have not noticed. So what about when things are not going so well and don't go planned and, and in a bad way? So obviously all this has been very positive, but can there still be serendipity there? So I want to talk about like one of my favorite examples of serendipity, which I think illustrates um, serendipity in apparent failure really well, which is the invention of the post-it note. And I love this, I don't know if you guys know it, but I'll, I'll tell you the story. So basically, a 3M R&D employee was tasked with finding a formula for really strong adhesive. And um, he continuously failed to do so. In fact, he made an adhesive that was super weak and was actually weaker than what they had developed. It would stick on objects, but it could also be lifted off really easily. And so obviously this was seen as a failure and they didn't use it for anything. But then, a little, bit while, a little while later, one of his colleagues um, was trying to, you know, he like had a choir book or something like that and had, um, was trying to use bookmarks that were just paper and they kept on falling out, which was super annoying. And so he remembered this uh, adhesive that his colleague had made and he applied it to his page markers. And then it was like a eureka moment, right? And the post-its were born from that moment. And I love this story for many reasons. I think it's very delightful. Um, and one of the reasons is because it challenges us to change our perspective when facing apparent failure, right? In some cases, like post-it notes, the unexpected result is actually better than what you were looking for originally, right? So serendipity doesn't always happen just as like a happy outcome um, in a happy situation, but it can also manifest in situations that might seem to be apparent failures when we're aware and flexible enough to see it as such, to see it as an opportunity. Um, I think that when we talk about overcoming failure, a lot of times the expected answer is along the lines of like, I overcame this with sheer hard work and I like doubled down and I did more and I did more. And I think that's absolutely the right approach in many cases and I think entrepreneurship is very much a war of attrition and outlasting your competition and sticking to your guns. Um, but what if we were also open to thinking of failure as a catalyst for innovation and discovery. And as an unexpected result, that's maybe pointing you to something that you didn't notice before, that maybe in some cases even more important, right? So last thing is to observe carefully, especially when you fail, because those moments might be ripe for serendipity. So um, just to close up, I wanted to leave you with one of my favorite definitions of serendipity that I stumbled upon, which is seeing bridges where other people see holes. And I really like this definition because it frames serendipity not as a random occurrence, but actually as a capacity for an individual, right? To envision something that is possible out of what is nothing. And for me, I think this has played out in the way that um, very early on, I was just kind of pursuing my hobby, but that led to a unique opportunity that was really old, like tailor-made for me, right? That seemed like luck, but I was really set up for. And I think that it played out in the ways that my co-founders and I, um, when we were launching you know, Freeze and then her campus, like saw something beyond, right? And saw these dots that we could connect and saw that there was actually something really much bigger than we had envisioned that was there. And maybe it plays out during apparent moments of failure where there seem to be only holes, right? So can we see bridges in those moments instead? grasping opportunities within setbacks? Can we engineer more serendipity into our lives by, I think, the key things being being more observant, being flexible, being willing to take risks, and being curious? 
I really believe that if we prepare ourselves in this way, we will invite serendipity into our lives. Thank you. But I think the, the thing about serendipity is that you actually end up realizing something that you were blind to before. So I think a good example maybe, um, I always feel like a failure when people leave my team, right? It happens for various reasons, like people leave for many different reasons. And I always feel like a failure in those moments. And I can, it can be tempting to get really down on yourself. Um, but what I've noticed recently is that it's actually in those moments that um, there's a lot of potential for you to discover things that you were blind to. And so recently when an employee left who had been with us for a long time, um, I you know, was initially really unsure how that would impact the team and the company. And um, turns out that it was serendipity in disguise because there were a lot of things that I could change about the way that my team worked and things like that. And, um, it just took, I think, taking a closer look at it, staying observant, like I said, and being aware of like, hey, what is this trying to teach me? Um, and, and then changing my perspective and viewing it as um, not a completely positive thing, right, but something that was, that I wouldn't have been open to if that hadn't happened. Yeah. Uh, being so young and having accomplished quite a bit, um, are, I know you talked about serendipity, but do you have any like goals and objectives like, do you want to buy the Jets or something? <laughs> Is there something that you want to do uh, by a certain time? Um, to be completely honest, I don't think um, that long term. <laughs> And I think that my personality is very much like living in the moment. And that might be like exactly why this has happened because I'm not really looking too far ahead. I'm just kind of aware of what's going on around me. Um, so I don't, I don't really have any grand plans like that. I think I wanna just continue growing the business. Um, I'm gonna be moving to a different city soon. So I'm excited to see what that holds for me um, while still continuing to work with her campus. Uh, so, I don't know, I'm just taking it really day to day right now, I think. Yeah. Um, what guidance do you have for people who are considering leaving their job without another job? Yeah, that's tough. Um, and I think I was really lucky because I ran her campus for a full year before I had to leave because I was still a student. So I ran it for uh, my entire junior year before I took a leave of absence. So I think that um, at a certain point you have to go for it if you really feel passionate, but you can make it easier for yourself by kind of getting started, maybe building a prototype while you're still doing something else. And for me, you know, during school was the perfect time uh, because I could always fall back on that if it didn't really work out. Um, so if you're able to kind of, like, again, going back to that minimum viable product, like test your hypotheses, see if you can, see if there's something there before you actually have to take the leap, that of course will reduce your risk. All right, let's sit it right there. 